you're here to worship with us, will you stand and sing? It's going to be a glorious day one day when we walk through the gates of heaven and meet our Lord and Savior face to face. Here we go. I was very beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb till I met you. And I was breathing but not alive. All my failures I tried to hide. It was my turn till I met you. Here comes. Are you ready to worship the Lord? Yeah, amen. In the book of Revelation, the first chapter, it says, I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the golden lampstands was someone like the Son of Man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet with golden sash and his chest. The hair of his head was white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in the furnace and his voice was like the sound of rushing winds waters in his right hand he held seven stars and coming out of his mouth was a sharp double-edged sword his face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance when i saw him i fell at his feet as though dead then he placed his right hand on me and said do not be afraid i am the first i am the last i am the living one i was dead 
And now look, I'm alive forever and ever, and I behold the keys of death forevermore. God bless, let's rejoice.
There's a place where streams of grace flow deep and
is found. I'm at the cross. At the cross, at the cross, I surrender my life. I'm in all of you. I'm in all of you. Where your love ran red and my sin washed white, I Church, let's pray together. God, I just thank you for a time where we can come and just sing the praises of Jesus, God, where we can come and be in all of you, where we surrender our lives, we surrender all that we are, and we just uh, marvel at the awesomeness of God. I thank you that the love of your Son, Jesus Christ, flowed on a cross, that those that believe on the name of him would have everlasting life. God, we thank you for that promise. May we surrender ourselves to you. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Sing it. At the cross, at the cross, I've surrendered my life. I'm in all of you. I'm in all of you. When your love ran red and my sin. Church, as we close our worship time this morning, I just pray that you'll get on your knees and just pray the blessings that you've been given by our Lord and Savior. Pray for the desires of your heart. Let's close this time in worship. We open up this place that you may come.
Amen. You may be seated. Well, we have something that we're going to do now that's very exciting here at East Richland French Church. We have uh, some baby dedications that we're going to do. And uh, so if you are uh, slated today to have your baby or your children dedicated, come on up at this time. We've got the Kelly family and the Dimmerling family. And if any friends or family that want to come up and surround them, we'd be happy to have you come up at this time. Come on up. One way to go, grow a church, Pastor Jerry, right? <laughs> oh, wonderful. Right, let's come on up here. Got the Dimmerlings coming up. All right. Let me read some verses for you. Uh, some of these words spoken by Jesus when he was challenged. Uh, this is in Luke 18, beginning in verse 15. It says, this people were also bringing babies to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. When the disciples saw this, they rebuked them. But Jesus called the children to him and said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. We have the Kelly family with us today. They're uh, a little bit newer with our church family, and we're so glad to have you, Shan and Mandy. And uh, this is Jace. Is that right? Maybe we should just let him stay in your hands. Would that be okay? Or Rachel can hold him. Whatever. No, I'm sick. I'll, I'll try it if, if, he'll, if he'll let me. Is that Jace? Okay. This feels good. <laughs> I've done it a few times before. Well, Shannon and Mandy, what I like to call this is really a parent dedication because we're asking you in front of witnesses if you're willing to raise Jace up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Is that your desire today? Yes. Yes. All right. Family, come on and gather around here. We want to put some hands on little Jace here and we'll have some, we'll have some prayer for him. He is out. <laughs> I haven't even preached yet. <laughs> Let's go ahead and pray for little Jace. Father, we thank you so, so much for this new little life. 
that you've given this family in Jesus. Father, what a precious little one this is. Father, we thank you for the, for the example of rest that he has right now. And Father, we pray upon him that he would come to know you at an early age, that he might be able to enter into eternal rest through your son, Jesus Christ. Father, we pray that you would use him in a mighty way. Father, may many come to know you through the example and ministry of Jesus. And Father, we pray for a special blessing upon Shan and Mandy as they desire to raise him up in a way that would honor and glorify you. And so, Father, I bless him now in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. also have Jackson. This is Jackson, everybody. Do you think he'll come come to Pastor Keith? Can you come see me real quick? Nope. That's okay. That is all right. Well, I'm going to ask you the same questions in relation to Jackson here. Is it your desire to raise Jackson up in the nurture and, ad, nurture and admonition of the Lord? Yes. Okay. Excellent. Wonderful. Church family, I'm going to ask you to show your support of the Kelly family in your helping them raise these boys up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. If you're willing to do that, will you please stand at this time? You see your new church family here all over the sanctuary showing their support for you. Let's, let's, uh, let's pray over Jackson here. Father, we come before you on behalf of Jackson. We thank you so much for this little boy. Father, we pray that you would just help him to have a life that is, that is fully honoring and glorifying to you. Father, we pray that you would help him to come to know you at an early age. And Father, that through him, there would be ministry uh, of encouragement for other people to come to know you. And so, Father, we pray for this family, that you would give them the strength that they need with these gifts that you've given to them, Lord, to raise them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And so, Father, I pray a special blessing upon Jackson right now in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, and we have, a, we have another one. Why don't you guys come on over here? All right, and you can remain standing. It's okay. And we have little Ellie here, Ellie Dimmerling. This is Mark and Autumn Dimmerling and, uh, and some family and friends here. And we're so glad to have you guys here with us. Oh, hi, sweetheart. Do you, do you think she'll let me hold her? Oh, that's <laughs> awesome. Oh, my goodness. We'll see how long it lasts. I knew it, Ellie. I saw you in the hospital. You can't even believe it. Well, Mark and Autumn and family, I want to ask you if it is your desire to raise little Ellie up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Is that true? Yes, and church family, we want to encourage you to come alongside the Dimmerling family. And I'd like to hear you, would you be willing to come alongside this family and raise little Ellie up in the nurture ad and admonition of the Lord? If so, say we will. Yeah. Amen, amen. We'll gather, put some hands on little Ellie here, and we're going to pray for her right now. Come on up, you guys. Father, we come before you with little Ellie here. We thank you so much for giving this precious gift to Mark and Autumn. Lord, you know the circumstances surrounding all of that and what a miracle she is. And so, Father, we lift her up to you right now. Lord, may she surrender her life to you at an early age. Father, we pray that as she grows into a young woman, that you would use her to spread the gospel message of the world to many, many people. And so, Father, we pray a special blessing upon her in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And Father, we pray for Mark and, and Autumn and the family as they come alongside her, give them the strength that they need to... Uh, to uh, raise this little girl up to look like Jesus Christ. And we pray for all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. You guys may be seated. Let's uh, show them some love here this morning with a round of applause. Well, we certainly have a lot to be thankful for. And uh, this church, uh, this church family is certainly one of those things that we have to be uh, thankful for. And uh, as, as we think about just how good God is to us and, and just how much he just continually support into our lives, uh, we get to show our faithfulness as well during this time as we take up our morning offering uh, to really just recognize, man, God is continuing to use us in this church to really be a light uh, in this uh, community and even beyond. And so ushers. Where will you run, my soul? Where will you go when wells run dry? When the wind starts to blow, how you gonna keep this flame alive? In the fading light when night is breaking, I know you will always be waiting. You'll always be there. I'm running to the secret place where you are, where you are. I'll sing to 
شایسته You will not let me go I know that I am safe inside your head In the fading night and night is breaking I know you will always be waiting You'll always be there I'm running to the secret place awake to life we are satisfied here with you here with you chains will hit the floor broken lives restored we couldn't ask for more here with you here with you know who that is. That is Adam and Allie Hunley, brother and sister duet, and uh, the children of Kim and Phil Hunley. We're so thankful for them. Thanks for coming back and being with us. Hadley, would you come up to read scripture for us? Hadley Pettit is going to read our scripture this morning. She is the daughter of Brian and Penny Pettit, and a student at uh, Palm Beach Atlantic University. We got some roots there and studying nursery right and I want to say how thankful I am for this girl she moved in here with her parents not knowing any of us and jumped in and worked so hard in our youth ministry she is deeply missed and appreciated thank you let's stand be reading from Psalm 77 verses 7 through 11 or 7 through 12 will the Lord reject forever will he never show his favor again has his unfailing love vanished forever has his promise failed for all time has God forgotten to be merciful has he in anger withheld his compassion then I thought to this I will appeal the years when the most high stretch out his right hand I will remember the deeds of the Lord yes I will remember your miracles of long ago I will consider all of your works and meditate on all of your mighty deeds. You may be seated.
Well, good morning and happy Thanksgiving to you. I notice you're sitting just a little farther apart from one another. Do you need a wide berth today after a big meal? I, I don't know. I hope you had a wonderful time uh, celebrating with friends and family over this weekend here. Uh, it is always a privilege to spend some time sharing with you from the Word of God, and I can't think of a better way to get started than with prayer. Will you pray with me? <clears throat> Father, we come to you with grateful hearts, with thanksgiving. You've told us often in your Word that we are to approach you with thanksgiving. And so we do so this morning, thanking you for the goodness, the graciousness, the love and the mercy, Lord, the justice and the righteousness of who you are. Father, we thank you that each of those things apply directly to us through your son, Jesus. And so, Father, we're ultimately thankful for the gift of eternal life through him. Father, we thank you so much for the time of worship that we've had so far together today. Father, we pray that it would be received by you as a sweet aroma. Father, as we take some time to look into your word, I just pray that you would guide every thought that comes into my mind and every word that comes out of my mouth. Father, but more so that your Holy Spirit would do a work of transformation in what people hear today, that each would be blessed and encouraged in the way that you want them to. And so, Father, we pray that you would <clears throat> bind Satan from influencing anything that happens in here today. Father, we want to tell you that we love you. We commit this time to you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. <clears throat> well, as we're uh, winding down Thanksgiving, I heard a, <clears throat> heard a story one time about a, a newlywed cousin in this particular family who was not well known for her cooking, and uh, she really wanted to host the extended family for Thanksgiving this year. And so they let her do that, and of course, while she was cooking, they all joked about whether she would remember to unthaw the turkey or pull out the bag of giblets from the turkey before she cooked it. And uh, as, as she was cooking the turkey and getting things ready, they noticed, uh, well, an odd, strange uh, smell coming uh, from the kitchen. And it was time for Grandpa to carve the turkey. So it was out on the plate, and Grandpa was carving the turkey. And all of a sudden, he goes, what in the world? He turned the turkey over, and there was this black blob sticking off of the, the bottom of the turkey. They soon found out it was the sink stopper. So apparently when she was washing the turkey, the stopper had gotten jammed in the bottom of it, and she ended up cooking it, and so what they were smelling was roasted rubber. And needless to say, the family said grace over their vegetarian meal that year. You know, we're in the midst of the holiday season here, whether you like it or not. They are upon us here in the Midwest. Uh, the weather begins to change, and we have some more gray skies and cooler temperatures, and, and uh, that, can, that can really make us discouraged and give us some dreary days in our lives. But you know what? The effects of the weather, the effects of this time of year, don't hold a candle to some of the real difficulties that people are experiencing in their lives. And, and I want to introduce you today to a biblical author who experienced something very difficult in his life, and his name was Asaph. Now, Asaph was uh, one of the authors of the Psalms. He wrote several of them. He was from the tribe of Levi, and actually, he was a worship leader in the temple. As a matter of fact, look at 1 Chronicles <clears throat> chapter 6. It says a little bit about him. These are the men David put in charge of the music in the house of the Lord after the ark came to rest there. They ministered with music before the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, until Solomon built the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem. They performed their duties according to the regulations laid down for them. And down in verse 39, we read about this. And Haman's associate Asaph was one of these men who served at his right hand. Asaph, son of Berechiah, the son of Shimea. All of the Psalms that Asaph wrote dealt with the judgment of God, and some reflected on the prayers of his people. And we see in this particular Psalm, Psalm 77, the discouragement and despair of one who is in a difficult time in his life. And I just want to pause for a moment and ask you, are you there right now? Are you in a difficult time in your life that's causing you some discouragement? Isn't it encouraging to know that there is a biblical author, one who is inspired by the Holy Spirit himself to write part of the Bible that we hold in our hands today? And he went through a difficult time too. And so what we're going to do is see how he navigated through this. But but we get in these difficult times, often around the holidays. 
They can kind of increase our emotional instability, if you will. Some people call it the holiday blues. They can even mimic depression and discouragement in other times of the year, what people feel this time of year. It's often brought on by an increase of stress over the holiday activities, hosting parties, going Christmas shopping, bad eating habits, whatever it might be that contribute to the possibility of you being discouraged over the holiday season. But, but let's be honest, extended family can sometimes be stressful for us, right? You know exactly who's popping into your mind right now. You do. I heard a story one time of a Christian comedian, Mark Lowry. Some of you have heard of Mark Lowry. He used to sing with the, the Gaithers, and, and he talks about when he was a child. He was a hyperactive child, and he bounced around from classroom to classroom in elementary school until he finally ended up in the classroom of this wonderful lady who told him, you know what, Mark? God likes hyperactive kids. And Mark said, you know, I had heard that God loved me, that's who God is. He is love, but I had never heard that God liked me before. And Mark began to think. He said, you know, there are people in this world that I love, but I, I don't like. And he said, I go through Thanksgiving and Christmas too, right? And maybe that's, maybe that's true for some of you. Again, somebody popped into your head right now. He said, you know who they are in your life. You'll cry at their funeral, but you don't want to go on vacation with them, right? We have these challenges and stresses at this time of year, that can lead to some, some great discouragement. <clears throat> and I want to share with you how Asaph navigated this discouragement, and I hope, I hope that you find a connection with him today. <clears throat> we encourage you to look along, follow along in your Bibles. If you don't have one today and you'd like to, we have them in the pews for you. Of course, the verses will be up on the screen, but you'll find this passage in the pew Bibles on page 406 or page 416 if you'd like to grab one and follow along in a paper Bible. Let's, let's get things started here. We're going to begin at verse 1 in chapter 77 of Psalm, and it says this, I cried out to God for help. I cried out to God to hear me. When I was in distress, I sought the Lord at night. I stretched out untiring hands and would not be comforted. I remembered you, God, and I groaned. I meditated and my spirit grew faint. You kept my eyes from closing. I was too troubled to speak. I thought about the former days, the years of long ago. I remembered the songs in the night. And what we're going to do as we unpack this passage this morning is first of all, we're going to see what reveals a troubled heart. <clears throat> what are some of the things as Asaph wrote this psalm that, that revealed this troubled heart within him? We're essentially going to look at what are some of the indications that someone's heart is hurting. And I wonder if you're experiencing any of these. First of all, we see in verse 1 that he was crying out. Asaph was physically with his voice crying out to God. This is the way he approached God. And what I find interesting is that in the midst of his despair, <clears throat> and some of the things we're going to discover in a few minutes here, Asaph still knew that God was the one that he needed to go to. He was crying out to God because that's where he should go for help and he knew that he would be heard. But in the midst of this trouble, we often feel as though God doesn't hear us. Have you ever been there? Have you ever felt like you've cried out to God and it doesn't seem as though he's responding to you? Listen to the testimony of King David where he says in Psalm 3, I call out to the Lord and he answers me from his holy mountain. Psalm 142 Verse 1 says this, <clears throat> David again says, I cry out to the Lord, I lift up my voice to the Lord for mercy. Have you ever verbally cried out to God? Have you ever been in your room by yourself and you called out to God for help? I have a younger sister. She's about 13 years younger than I am. And I can remember, and, and I got permission to share this by the way, I can remember when my sister and I were in a, a concert, it was probably a Christmas concert at the Christian school that we were in, and she was probably five years old or something, and they were sitting up, as good parents do, with their kids in the front row, and, and uh, her name is Beth, and Beth was kind of acting up a little bit, and Dad told her, if you don't settle down, I'm going to have to take you out. And so Beth just decided not to listen to Dad, and she kept kind of being a distraction, and so Dad took her from the, from the pew down the aisle, and the whole way down the aisle, she was screaming, help me, help me, somebody help me. Can you imagine this at a concert? 
Oh, my goodness. Well, it's funny because I guess the people there, I don't remember this, reacted just like you did, but nobody helped. It was kind of interesting to her. But I got to thinking, I got to thinking about this parallel, this parallel between that experience that she had and us. You see, Beth had gotten into that situation because of her own disobedience. And there are times <clears throat> when we find ourselves in circumstances for whatever reason, and we're crying out to God for help, and it seems like maybe he's not there to help us. But there are times in the midst of our consequences that we cry out for help. Well, in verse 2, we see not only that he cried out, but he was in distress. We see this in verse 2, that he was in distress, and, and he says while he was seeking for comfort, and we notice that because it talked about his outstretched hand. He was looking for the comfort of God. He says, I would not be comforted. How do we process this? I was seeking for comfort, comfort, and yet I would not be comforted. And it happens for us, many of us, <clears throat> there's this uncanny dynamic when we are familiar with pain to live in the middle of that pain as a comfort zone. Think about it. If pain is what you've known in your entire life, at least it's familiar. And when it causes, when God causes you to come out of that pain, it can be an unsecure feeling. And perhaps, perhaps Asaph was thinking, I want to come out of this pain, but, but I just can't right now. He said, I, I wouldn't be comforted. There's a familiarity with pain and distress, distress such that stepping out of it can be scary for people. But well, not only was he distressed, but we see in verse 3 that he had some confused thinking. He had some confused thinking. His mind was beginning to, to work in a way that it shouldn't have been. He says that while he was uh, thinking about God, pondering about God, meditating on God, it caused him to grow faint and to groan. Did you hear that when I was reading it? He said he groaned, and this word for groan actually means to complain. Now, none of us would ever complain in the midst of our trials, would we? You see, that's exactly what Asaph was doing. He was in distress, and, and all of the circumstances began to twist his thinking. And he began to complain about his circumstances. And he says in that verse that the very thought of God brought him anguish. As he was, as he was dealing with his distress, when God would come back to his mind, it actually caused him more distress, more anguish. And then we see that he was struggling with sleeplessness, with sleeplessness. Now, here's what's interesting. In verse 4, Asaph mentions that his eyes would not close, but did you catch how he qualified it? Listen to this again in verse 4. He says, you kept my eyes from closing. What did Asaph just do? He just blamed God for that circumstance. Did you catch that? He said, you're the one that kept my eyes from closing. You see, a troubled heart can result in blaming God for our circumstances. Has that ever been the case for you? Listen to what the Bible says about that. We have to be careful. Proverbs 19.3 says this, a person's own folly leads to their ruin, yet their heart rages against the Lord. Have you ever been there before? finding yourself in circumstances that, that you may have brought on by not being obedient to God, and yet you blame him for it. Look at this in Romans 9.20. We are reminded, but who are you, a human being, to talk back to God? Shall what is formed say to the one who formed it, why did you make me like this? And you might be sitting there thinking, I would never blame God. I understand who he is. But have you? Have you ever blamed God for your circumstances? I challenge you on that. But I want to share with this, this with you today. There is a distinct difference between blaming God and understanding his sovereignty. That's a big step for us to take in our finite minds to understand the sovereignty of an infinite God. And folks, that comes through trust. Asaph was struggling with that. But when we're in the middle of discouragement, we tend to seek answers to the why questions. Have you ever asked God why? Maybe in your crying out, the word that you're using is why. We're looking for the answer to that question, even if it means that we conclude that God is at fault. What a challenge to us today. And then we see this in verses 5 and 6. 
he had a longing for the past. He had a, a longing for the past. We see this in some of the phrases that he used. Now, well, let's call this the daydream escape. Have you ever been daydreaming before? You see, what daydreaming does is it takes us out of the circumstances of today and it sets us in the circumstances of a better time often. And it is a way for us to forget about what's going on today for a little bit and move into a place that was happier for us. It's a way of escape that does not include the Lord. All of these heart conditions are fueled, and I want you to catch this, by comparing what we wish life was like to what life really is like. We compare what we wish life was like now to what it really is like. And that causes discouragement. The expectations that we have that may be unfounded are causing our discouragement. Those things that we wish were happening could be causing our discouragement. And sometimes we take a look at the past to relive those good times. Now, let's move on in our passage here. Beginning in verse 6, reading verses 6 through 9. Second part of verse 6 says, My heart meditated and my spirit asked, Will the Lord reject forever? Will he never show his favor again? Has his unfailing love vanished forever? Has his promise failed for all time? Has God forgotten to be merciful? Has he in anger withheld his compassion? And now we've seen what, what are some of the ways to reveal a troubled heart. Let's take a look now at what is the reaction of a troubled heart. How did Asaph react to these circumstances in which he found himself? In a word, with confusion. He was confused, and so to try to clear things up, he began to ask these questions, six to be exact, and six questions that he asked were questions about the very character of God. Asaph was confused in the midst of his circumstances. We find that, don't we, sometimes? There's a, there's a fogginess that comes over us, but I want you to know this morning that how we handle the troubling times in our, in our lives reveals exactly what we think about God. How you handle your difficult circumstances will reveal what you think about God. And Asaph was trying to work this out in this confused time of thinking that he had here. And so we're going to go through each of these questions very quickly. But what I would like to do to encourage you this morning is to see how the Word of God defeats every single one of these questions. Let's do this today. So Asaph questioned, first of all, God's acceptance. Asaph questioned God's acceptance. We see that in the middle of discouragement, we can lose sight of how God has demonstrated his acceptance of us. You see, we can lose sight of that. And the best way to talk about God's acceptance of us through his son Jesus is this one term, adoption. Let's read a couple of verses about this. 2 Corinthians six eighteen says this, and I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. John 1, verses 12 and 13 say this, Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. And I want to remind you this morning that if you have a relationship with God through his son Jesus Christ, you have been adopted into the family of God. And you know what that means? You now have the favor of the creator of the universe in your life. Boy, that's a way to turn around some discouragement, isn't it? Remembering what God has done for you through Jesus, that you and I now might be called the children of God. First John says, Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us, that we should be called the children of God. You are not defined by your circumstances. You are defined by your relationship with Jesus Christ. What an encouragement that is. I want to I remind you of that. As we talk about this next point here, something that he questioned was God's pleasure with him. He questioned God's acceptance of him, and, and now he's questioning God's pleasure with him. Look at what Psalm 149 verse 4 has to say. I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible on this one. It says this, for the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He will beautify the afflicted ones with salvation. Did you catch that? 
Maybe this is what you needed to hear today. I want you to know that the Bible says that the Lord takes pleasure in you. You are pleasurable for him. And you know how we know that? Because the end result of our relationship with him is salvation. That's what he has given you and me through his son, Jesus Christ. Those of us who were at one time afflicted because of our sin now live in the freedom of salvation. What an incredible demonstration of God's pleasure with us. You are the result of God's particular special creation. From the very beginning, man was set apart. Asaph also questioned God's love. Questioned his acceptance, his pleasure with him. And now he's questioning God's love. And we don't need to go any farther than this verse here. John 3.16 for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And so if you haven't been convicted yet in the middle of your circumstances, listen to this one. I want to remind you of the extreme value that you and I have. God gave his son for you and for me. That's why we're here today because he did that. How could we ever question his great love for us? What greater expression of God's favor and love toward his creation could he have made? And so why is it in the middle of our despair that we question God's love for us? Remember, in the middle of your troubled time, it all comes back to the gospel. The next thing he questioned was God's promise. God's promise. Clearly, Asaph's heart was in a place where he thought the very promise of God was in fault. But notice this. It doesn't say that he questioned God's promise says. Look at this in 2 Peter 1.4. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. All of these promises that God has given us through our relationship with him allows us, Peter says, to have this inter interaction with the divine nature of God. What an amazing thing. So if Asaph wasn't questioning God's promises, what is it that he was questioning? He wasn't necessarily questioning the power of God with this statement. He was questioning if the word of God was true. Will God keep what he said? Listen to this verse. 2 Peter 3, 9 says this, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. And what is this promise that God has the power to fulfill? It is your salvation and my salvation. And sometimes when we get in the midst of our struggles and circumstances that are hurting our hearts deeply, we just wish that God would return, right? Have you ever said, come quickly, Lord? But you know what? This verse tells us that he is not slow in keeping that promise. Salvation is there for us. It is you and me that he is waiting on. Boy, that really turns this around. God has the power to keep the promise that he made. The next thing that Asaph questioned was God's mercy. God's mercy. And I want to read for you a couple of verses. The guys don't have it on the screen because I just want you to hear this. The same word for mercy that is used in Psalm 77 is also used for love in Psalm 136. Let me read a couple of these for you. So when you hear the word love, plug in mercy. It's the same word. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. His love endures forever. To him who alone does great wonders, his love endures forever. Who by his understanding made the heavens, his love endures forever. Who spread out on the earth the waters, his love endures forever. Who made the great lights, 
His love endures forever. The sun to govern the day, his love endures forever. The moon and the stars to govern the night, his love endures forever. To him who struck down the firstborn of Egypt, his love endures forever. What a great reminder of the mercy and the loving kindness that God has for us, and yet we question it in the middle of our troubles, just like Asaph did. Finally, we see that Asaph questioned God's compassion. All of these questions that he's come down to this one, he questioned God's compassion. You see, in the Old Testament, the authors thought of the, the, the warm and tender emotions as being represented by the womb. And essentially, what Asaph was questioning was this, God, have you closed up the womb of your compassion on me. He felt, he felt disowned, disbanded. But listen to what Asaph himself wrote in Psalm 78. Yet he was merciful. He forgave their iniquities and did not destroy them. Time after time he restrained his anger and did not stir up his full wrath. He remembered that they were but flesh, a passing breeze that does not return. Asaph himself remembered that even though at one time in his life he was questioning the compassion of God, that he was rich in mercy and didn't allow those that he loved to be, a, to be a, a, an exhibit of his wrath because he forgave their iniquities and didn't destroy them. What an amazing thing that we consider. These questions that Asaph asked, have you asked some of those questions? Oh, maybe we've used different words to ask those questions. But these are the questions that come out of a reaction of a troubled heart. Now, let's take a look at verses 10 through 12. Verses 10 through 12 say this in Psalm 77. Then I thought, to this I will appeal. The years when the Most High stretched out his hand, I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your miracles of long ago. I will consider all your works and meditate on all your mighty deeds. And here we see, in these, these verses here, what the remedy of a troubled heart is. We've seen the, what reveals a troubled heart. We've seen the reaction of a troubled heart. And now we see the remedy for a troubled heart. Notice in verse 10, he begins with this thought, this realization. He says, to this I will appeal. And as I was studying this verse, I found out that there's kind of a difficult interpretation of this. Of this. So we're not going to walk through all of that, but I, I want to let you know that it seems best to understand this statement as a self-recognition that I had it wrong. That's essentially what Asaph was saying. He had this troubled heart. He asked all these questions about the character of God, and then he has this realization, oh, but I've gotten it wrong. And you know what it is that he got wrong? He began to think that God had changed. Have you ever struggled with that before? God must have changed because of my circumstances. It doesn't seem like he's here with me right now. Because in our grief and our hurt, in our confusion about our circumstances, in that fogginess that we feel sometimes, we may just think God has changed. And I want to tell you today that that is impossible. The Bible tells us that God never changes. Listen to these verses. He Hebrews 13, 8 says this. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday today and forever. How about this verse from Malachi 3.6? The Lord himself says, I, the Lord, do not change, so you, the descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Did you catch what he is saying about himself there? He is saying, because I don't change, you can have the confidence of redemption. You can have the confidence of being rescued. This is a wonderful thing for us to realize about God. Because we understand the Bible says that we only come to a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And we know, folks, that that will never change. And because God never changes, we know that we have the promise of eternal life with him forever and ever. Face to face with our Savior because God never changes. What an incredible, incredible testimony this morning that we hear from these verses. You see, we must understand this before we can accept the first part of this remedy for a troubled heart which is to remember God's track record. 
Remember God's track record. Every single one of us has proof of the past of what God has done in our lives. And I know that I don't know all of your stories in here today, but one thing I do know is that God has a perfect track record in your life. I know he does. God is not capable of not being faithful. And so his faithfulness always endures in our lives. Oh, from our earthly perspective, he might seem like he changed, that he's not faithful. But look at this verse on his faithfulness, Deuteronomy 7, 9. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God. He is the faithful God, keeping the covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commandments. How about 2 Timothy 2, verse 13? <clears throat> if we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself. I hope this gives you some freedom today, brothers and sisters. Your faithfulness and my faithfulness to God does not affect his faithfulness. His faithfulness is not contingent upon you and I being faithful because we know that there are times when we will be unfaithful to God. What an amazing, amazing reality that is for us. And one of the best ways to remember God's faithfulness in your life is to share it with somebody else. Think back. Don't live back there. But think back when God was faithful in a, in a very significant way in your life. And there's something about hearing ourselves speak out loud the testimony of what God has done in our lives and I want you to consider this, that the trouble that you feel today, that the troubled heart that you have today, the circumstance in which you find yourself today will one day be that you, which you look back on to see God's faithfulness. What an amazing truth that is. What's going on today, someday you'll look back and you'll say, I can see now how God was faithful in that circumstance. An amazing, amazing thing that we have in the faithfulness of God. In this verse in 2 Timothy says, he cannot disown himself. So if anybody ever asks you, is there anything that God cannot do? The answer is yes. He cannot do anything against his own nature. And you and I will be eternally grateful in praising him for that. Finally, we see that this remedy is us recognizing the truth of God's might. We need to recognize the truth of God's might. And listen, if you can't get there right now, I get it. In the middle of difficult times, it's hard to just flip that switch. But it will come. But I want you to remember this. When it comes to God's might, he brought people back to life. I'm not talking about Lazarus. I'm talking about you, and I'm talking about me. God loved me so much that he brought me back to life. And I know he's done that for some of you. Listen to what Ephesians chapter 2 has to say. Verse 1 says, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. Down in verse 4, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in transgressions, it is by grace that you have been saved. We should celebrate that this morning. I'm thankful for my family. I'm thankful for clothing and shelter. I'm thankful for this church. But I am ultimately thankful that God brought this dead man back to life. That's so exciting for us. Because he is that powerful. That is the God that we serve. And I don't care what the circumstances are in which you find yourselves, that is something to focus on this morning, folks that he can bring dead people back to life. Listen to this last verse. I know we need to get out of here. Deuteronomy 4.30 says this. When you are in distress and all these things have happened to you, then in latter days you will return to the Lord your God and obey him. Folks, is today the day that you need to return to the Lord your God? Have you had some confused thinking about who he is? Is it time for you to remember what he's done in the past and recognize the might and the power of the creator of the universe in your life today? And if you're here today and you say, Dave, I have never experienced the power of Jesus Christ in my life. I don't even know what you're talking about. Let me share it with you here. 
You see, your sin and my sin separates us from a holy God, the one that loves us so much, and he has to punish that sin. And he says, I will take a perfect human sacrifice to pay the penalty for your sin and for my sin. We could handle the human side, couldn't we? We could die for our sin, but last I checked, not a single one of us is perfect. And so there's a problem here. He says this perfect human sacrifice, but he solves that problem in the person of Jesus Christ, who the Bible tells us came here in the flesh, fully God and fully man. I cannot explain that to you, but I believe it because that's what the Bible says. To pay the penalty for your sin and my sin, to purchase a place for you and me in heaven that we might be with this glorious, majestic, all-powerful God forever and ever and ever. If you don't know him today, make today, today the day that you come to know him. As we open up the altar here in just a minute, I want you to consider, do I need to turn back to God? Is there something in my life that I need to repent from? Let today be the day. Why not have Thanksgiving 2018 be a spiritual landmark in your life? Let's stand. <clears throat> Father, as we stand before you today, let me just remark again that you are a great, great God. That we can't fathom the depths of your majesty and your holiness and your might. But Father, we thank you that we are recipients of each and every one of those things. Father, forgive us where we've had confused thinking, asking questions about your character. Draw us back to yourself and the truth and the clarity that can only come through Jesus Christ. And Father, if there is someone here today that does not know you, may today be the day that you introduce yourself to them. Father, we pray for those who need to repent, who need to turn back to you, that they would make those decisions today too. Father, we want to tell you that we love you. May you move in a mighty way as we sing in Jesus' name.